I'm quite excited to be at this event because um, I've been trying to speak to people um, about this issue within this industry f for quite a while, and it's been delightful to be invited to here today. Just to explain my background, I'm a former undercover police officer, so I used to catch drug dealers for a living. Now, mostly that meant heroin and crack cocaine. I'll tell you a, a little bit about it. Um, in the early 2000s, I'd just given up undercover work. I decided to give it up because it was too emotionally taxing. Uh, one of the people that I'd manipulated into introducing me to a gangster ended up being on suicide watch when he was in the police cells. And the reason for that was because he saw me as his only friend in the world, the person he could speak to. But you see, from an undercover police officer's point of view, vulnerable people are who I looked for because vulnerable people are the most easy to manipulate. So when I heard that about that person, I gave up undercover work. I thought, I can't, I can't handle this. I cannot continue causing this harm to people. But then I got a phone call two weeks later and they said, Woodsy, we need you to do this job. We need you to do this undercover operation because these gangsters are even worse than the last lot. These gangsters are using gang rape as a method of reputation building and intimidation. They're maiming people and doing all the kind of things that gangsters, other gangsters do, but they're also gang raping. So I was talked into, into um, doing that operation. And it was a gang called the Burger Bar Boys, very famous organized crime group from Birmingham in the UK. And they'd taken over the heroin and crack cocaine supply in a town called Northampton. Now, the reason that they'd taken over this supply is because the local police had had such success with their local heroin and crack cocaine dealers. So they were all arrested. So the big boys from the big city moved in. So I spent weeks trying to get to know these people. I found some more vulnerable people to manipulate. And I remember the day, actually, I finally got an introduction to the, to the Burger Bar Boys. I was taken to this snooker club in the center of Northampton. And I was directed into, um, into the gents' toilets. And within a minute, the door burst open and this hooded figure came in. He walked into a cubicle, stepped on the toilet, and then looked over the top of the door and said, what's this then? And then the door burst open again and these four hooded figures came in and they burst in and they started walking around me. So as this guy's interrogating me, asking me where I was from, who do I know, why am I coming to him? These guys are headbutting me and then punching me in the ribs. And this was going on for a long time. You know, this guy was rephrasing his questions, trying to catch me out. And it really felt like that you could almost feel the violence in the air. I became quite convinced that I wasn't going to walk out of that place in one piece. I mean, I knew the reputation of these people. I'd seen the police intelligence. One of them was implicated in seven different murders in Birmingham. So I knew what they were capable of. Anyway, eventually, the guy in the toilet said, all right then, what do you want? I thought, I said, I'll have one and one, please, which is 0.4 of heroin, 0.4 of crack. I paid him my 20 pound, 40 pounds, and he gave me the drugs, and I got his phone number, and then I was into them. That was the biggest hurdle. I was into them then. I got the phone number, and I spent the next few months building evidence of conspiracy against this gang. Now, there were six of them, six main gangsters, but they were using all of the local people, all of the local vulnerable people, the problematic heroin users, crack cocaine users, and all of the other dealers. So after seven months of that operation, there was evidence against 96 people in that town, 96 people. And I knew it was the time to do the bust because there was no one else to meet. I'd met every single person involved in the trade in that town. I'd got all the phone numbers that there was no one else to be introduced to. So there were five police forces contributed um, staff to that, to that raid, to the series of raids. 96 people arrested. A week afterwards, I spoke to the police officer who was uh, in, in charge of intelligence, the intelligence cell for the operation. And he says, yep, 
we managed to interrupt the heroin and crack cocaine supply for a full two hours. Two hours. 96 people, seven months of work to interrupt the drug supply for two hours. During that operation, I was threatened with a gun, a knife, and several times during that seven months, I thought I was going to die to interrupt it for two hours. Now, thinking about it, the Burger Bar boys got a rival gang that they're always shooting. They're always shooting each other, this gang. The other gang's called the Johnson crew. And you can just imagine the scene, actually, when all of the Burger Bar boys are caught, the Johnson crew back in their houses in Birmingham think, wonderful, put the call in, buy some extra drugs. We're going to make a killing. Because it only took two hours for their number to be out on the streets. And that's what I've come to learn, that actually in doing those arrests, you're creating an opportunity for someone else to make some money. Richard Branson says that um, the way to expand a business is to disrupt the market. Well, he's right. And the people who disrupt the market for drugs is the police. You have to put it in some context though. If the police arrest a burglar, burglaries go down because there's a limited number of people willing to commit that crime. If you arrest a drug dealer, crime goes up because there is competition to take that opportunity. And that's where the increased violence comes from. But my time wasn't all uh, with heroin and crack. Uh, to bring it relevant to this event, uh, I also sometimes used to infiltrate clubs. Now, I, I remember I, my first, first club I infiltrated was uh, a club called Progress in Derby. And it was a fantastic club. I got so into the music doing this work. I became to, I, I, I learned, you know, I found, I learned to love it. And um, I was desperately upset on that particular operation because my, my, um, the team decided to raid the club when Tony DeVitt was playing. Now, I, I don't know how, how many of you uh, follow the history of dance music, but Tony DeVitt, I mean, he was, he was a, a master, a, a pioneer of hard house. He was fantastic. And, you know, they bust, they raided that club at the moment he started his set. And the first record, can you imagine? I feel, I mean, I feel quite traumatized by, by much of the work I did, but that's one, of, well, it's one of those instances. But you know, when, when the drug squad came in and raided that club, there was a chill out area. And one, one of the drug squad came in that door, the fire door, and there was five youngish students stood there. And he said, you lot, hands in the air, hands on your head. And so they put their hands on their head. He then went into the club to make sure it was secure and they were left alone. A few minutes later, he came back to them and they're still there with their hands on their head. And he searched them and there was drugs on every single one of them. And he said, because we discussed this afterwards, he said, well, why, why did you not ditch the drugs? If you'd thrown them on the floor, I wouldn't be able to prove they were yours. And one of them said, well, because you told us to put our hands on our head. And you know, that, that was just one of the many instances that, that, that made me question the work I was doing. Okay, it's, it's perhaps easier to question the work I was doing with heroin and crack because I was, I was actually manipulating vulnerable people there, people who needed help. And I was preying on them, much as organized crime preys on them. But for this in the club, these were just five kids who were clearly law-abiding by any other means, so much so that the police officer says, put your hands on your head, they just do that. But then they've got a criminal record, and that blights them for the rest of their lives. This industry, this culture, this movement of electronic music, I, as I say, I've, I've learned to love it. But it's become very important, very important indeed, and it's about to get even more important. Forgive me for a moment if this seems a little left field, but I'm going to mention Vladimir Putin. This year, President Putin at the G20 summit in Japan made a, a, a speech, and he, he announced the death of liberalism. He said that it's outlived its purpose. 
outlived its purpose. And the speech really was a way of justifying the extreme intimidation and persecution that he has of his citizens, for example, homosexuals. And it's also a signal, saying it at the G20 summit, it's also a signal to other autocratic demagogues around the world. Now, it's obvious there's a problem around the world, would we agree, with populist politics, autocracy, oppression, whether it's Brazil, Hungary, Russia, even the countries that haven't yet succumbed, that there are political parties and movements which are worrying. Can, can we agree on that? Now, I wouldn't... Would you even judge me for saying that there's a, there's, a di there's a difference between good and evil here? Is that an extreme way of putting it? Is that too extreme? So this is important because that problem is going to grow. But how do liberal politicians and liberal regimes, and by that I don't mean party political liberal. I mean, you know, I've, we've got, uh, I, I've got supporters, my organization's got supporters from conservative politicians, liberal politicians and socialist politicians. I'm not talking about the differences between party politics. I'm talking about the liberal foundations of our democracy. How do progressive or just liberal politicians and regimes fight that kind of growth of populist autocracy? How do we do it? Well, the way we do it is through, through drug law reform. Because when we take the power away from organized crime by regulating our drug markets, we make our country safer. We reduce crime dramatically. When we start looking after problematic heroin users instead of jailing them, we reduce crime dramatically. And we stop persecuting people who just want to feel better or just want to have fun, our society will be happier. But the evidence will come with that. It is the single thing that we can do that can fight the rise of Putin and people like him. Because I'm sure we can all agree, everyone has a right to their own sexuality without persecution, yeah? So also, we all have the right to dance to the music we want to, yeah? So we also are in control of our own mind and bodies. That should be an absolute human right, yeah? But that isn't a human right yet. But if we establish that human right as a liberal philosophy, that's how we, fight, we start to fight this. So that's why I'm pleased to be here, because I want to, uh, to speak to anyone involved with the electronic music industry, anybody. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my organisation. Um, as I've said, I'm a, I'm a former undercover police officer, but I'm not the only one. Um, I'm part of the, an organisation called the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Now, it started in the United States, which I think is good, because they are the ones who lumbered us with this war on drugs in the first place. But it's spreading. It's spread to the UK. And in the UK, we have other un, un, former undercover cops like me, we have former senior police, former chief constables, former MI5. We've got former military who used to um, police the poppy fields in Afghanistan. So we cover the whole range, you know, even prison officers, prison governors. We cover the whole range of the criminal justice system to do with, with drugs. We're about to launch Leap France and Leap Europe as a, as a separate entity. We've got members in Poland, Belgium, um, Australia, and, and we are growing rapidly because police officers around the world get this. They get it. They see the intelligence that more violence has happened after raids. We see that it's causing crime, not reducing it. We see it. And so this movement is growing. But in terms of this industry, it's becoming more important and really because it's about to become the front line in this debate. And I'll explain. The cannabis debate is already won. It's already won. We still have to keep trying. We keep have to we keep have to the have to keep the advocacy going, but the argument is won. Canada is the big is the big game changer. The evidence was just released uh, yesterday of how successful their regulation is and the fact that usage hasn't gone up. 
this is going to spread. We've won the argument. There's, there's less pushback now because they, the people who don't want it can't win. So now it's moving to other drugs. And cannabis, really, the argument was won in part because the medical argument was won first. Because as soon as people started to see that there were medical benefits, then they changed their attitude to adult use. And there is some good data which backs that up. So the same thing, I believe, is about to happen with drugs associated with electronic music. MDMA, for example, uh, is now being shown in various countries to be very beneficial for PTSD and, and lots of other anxiety disorders. That's a very personal thing to me because I'm also, I am diagnosed with PTSD, like so many police officers who have been part of the drug war. But this isn't about me. This, um, the fact that MDMA is going to be so useful is going to change people's attitudes towards it. And it's going to make the discussion around adult use within the context of the dance music world, it's, it's going to become more prevalent. And there will be pushback. There will be pushback. There will be a sudden resistance from politicians, moralizing politicians who do not want the discussion, let alone any kind of liberal approach to this drug. So this music is already under attack from around the world. In Australia, they set up booths in train stations to strip search teenagers on the way to festivals. They stop them in train stations and strip search them on the say-so of a dog. A dog which statistics say is only, 20, only right one quarter of the time. Not much better than random. And, that, and there, are, there, are, there are calls to increase the amount of that in Australia. And that's the reaction to, to, to some MDMA deaths. Now, perhaps I should make this, this point, and you will all understand, you will all know this already. But because this is being recorded, I have to make this clear to anyone listening. MDMA is not banned because it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it's banned. That's very important to note. Virtually every MDMA death that's recorded could, could have been prevented if the product was regulated. But moralizing politicians will not want to hear that, and there will be a pushback. In the United States, the Rave Act is an abomination. It should be a regulatory requirement of any uh, club promoter, event organizer to provide harm reduction. It should be. That's good regulation. But in the States, you can be prosecuted for providing harm reduction. This is not right. So this industry, this culture is under attack. It's under attack in very underhand ways. And I'm sorry to be the voice of doom and warn, warn this, but it will get worse. There will be pushback. When the psilocybin trials uh, become more public, that magic mushrooms are actually a good treatment for, for depression, politicians won't want to hear that either. They will attack who they see are the people who will, who will put pressure on a change of legislation. An example in, my, in the history from the United Kingdom is when uh, rave culture took off in the early 90s, some of the best dance music of all time, in my opinion. Um, when it took off in the early 90s, there was a very a political pushback. So much so that the uh, Criminal Justice Act of 1994 actually contains the words repetitive beats. It actually uses those words. So it, it literally and unashamedly targeted electronic music within the body of the law. Any government in the world is capable of doing this. That's what they will do to react. So what can we do about it? Well, my organization is already speaking to politicians, already um, building alliances to protect this world of electronic music. In the UK this year, I spoke at um, both the Conservative and the Labour and the SNP party conferences, for example. So we are well connected. We are having the right conversations. We are. But 
And, and of course, that is that is our job. We are going to have more benefit doing that than someone who is a club promoter, for example, because a politician isn't necessarily going to listen to a promoter, but they will listen to a former cop who who's can tell them that what we're doing is causing harm. So yeah, that's our job. However, I, I see a lack of public social movement for change from within the electronic music world. And I want to try and kickstart that social movement. That social movement is very important. So really, this is an appeal for anybody who thinks that they can help if they want to get involved with my organization, particularly if you can provide us help, either with logistical or financial help. Leap in the United States does a huge amount already with criminal justice reforms. Um, but really, I'd like to be directing more of our energies towards protecting this culture because it now is the front line in this war. So if any of you want to help us, um, please do uh, get in touch with, with us. Um, I'm ready to have that conversation and uh, let, let's see what we can do. Um, so I'm going to stop for questions in a minute, but I just want to say thank you again uh, for inviting me. I feel really privileged to be at this particular conference. Um, being a dance music geek myself. Um, so thanks for listening. Any questions? You can ask me anything. Really. A former undercover cop, you know, if, give me a difficult question if you want. Do we have another mic? Okay. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. Um, just to touch on around the globe. I'm from the Philippines, which has an extreme, extreme um, approach to the war on drugs. So going back to the start of the um, afternoon where Basiani and all the other people were talking about establishing a scene against, uh, in the midst of oppressive conditions. And it's something that I can only dream, I live here now, but it's something I can only dream of uh, for where I come from. There have been about 20,000 extrajudicial killings um, for people found with any amount or form of drugs. If you, if you, if there's a raid and you are caught by the police, they can shoot you on sight. So it's not just about being strip searched or, um, so I, the conversation is so different in developing countries. And it's, it's kind of bizarre because when I hear you talk about it, I feel like, wow, this is utopia. This is what we should be heading to as a country. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. So as you were speaking about this, this comes up for me. And what I, I don't know if you have any experience with um, such oppressive, <laughs> oppressive drug laws, not just laws, but enforcement as well. Um, and how, yeah, I, I just want to know, I guess, how this conversation can extend to people from countries like mine. I'm, I'm really glad um, you raised that because th the reason that I, I do I do this full time um, and it's my reason for being now is because of the situation around the world and the, the, the global war on drugs is um, it's a genocide it, it's it's an, it's it's a dreadful it's a horrific thing i mean the philippines is one example um, but there there are others there are 20 countries with the death penalty for, for drugs. Sri Lanka began that again this year. Um, in Mexico, there's tens of thousands of people being murdered all the time. And, and maimings, maimings are um, like smoke signals. They're used, they're used just to send out as messages. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you, re you raised that because it is because it is a global problem that we all have a duty to do something that we have a duty that if, if you are listening to this and agree, then you are part of the social movement, but we all need to be more active. Even if that's just taking the time to follow organizations like mine on social media and share it, but really you try start taking the time to persuade other people or donate, donate to organizations like mine that can make a difference. Now, the reason I concentrated on the, the, the areas that I have today is because it's this, this event is very specific to, to electronic music. But you see, we will win this territory by, by territory. 
we will win this by policy change by policy change. And whether that's a, the, the victory so far, like uh, the regulation of cannabis in Uruguay, that's one small victory in one territory. But, you know, I, I attended the, um, the United Nations in Vienna, the meeting on, on narcotic drugs, where all the countries in the world argue this point. And we've a long way to go, but the only thing that's going to put pressure on the United Nations is by those small victories adding up. So we have a duty to the people in the Philippines to, to create, a, you say a utopia, but we have a, a, we have a duty to create the examples of where it works and where violence is reduced as a result of it. Because at the moment, it's actually Duterte is dominating the conversation. What he's saying is resonating with world, re world leaders, with demagogues around the world. He's saying, I'm sorting this problem out. Look, of course he isn't. He's causing more devastation for the next generation to be problematic drug users. He's creating a disaster, but he's controlling the narrative. So the only way we can win this is to start to control the narrative. And we do that with victories. And we do that with showing the evidence from those victories. So which so we need help to do this and we need to work together. We need a big team working on it. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm curious, is LEAP's objective more focused on decriminalization or legalization, or does it vary depending on the drug or the place? Our aim is the full regulation of all drug markets, to take the, all of the markets away from organized crime. Now, what that regulation looks like for different drugs, it can be very drastically different. For So, for example, heroin, which is actually the easiest one to regulate, you take care of problematic heroin users by being the supplier for them. That's what we used to do in Britain up till the end of the 1960s. We didn't have a problem with crime with heroin until we banned it. Until it was take, the power of the control of heroin was taken away from doctors with his prescription pad and it was given to gangsters. On the other end of the spectrum, cannabis, we've seen obvious examples of, of uh, regulation there. But for things like MDMA, we need licensed pharmacists. We need blister packs with the tablets inside so we know exactly how much is in there. We know it's pure. We know the conditions it was created. And you've got all of the education and advice on it and from the pharmacist to make sure you're using it as safely as possible. So, yeah, every single drug. I mean, of course, decriminalizing possession is, is good because we should not be persecuting people who use drugs. Of course. But decriminalization, coming from a law enforcement perspective, is not enough because the control is still in the hands of criminals. Yeah, there's a question behind you. This will uh, have to be the last one, I'm afraid. So. How can you actually control um, the fact that if you decriminalize certain drugs and you regulate the market for these drugs, actually there will be probably new one coming and then this will start a new black market for that and probably more appealing to people who don't want to follow the market, the suppliers, which are official. Well, no, there's actually evidence that if you regulate the market, you, that that do, that won't happen. I mean, actually, new drugs being created has been a has been a, a creation of prohibition. There's been a race to find new drugs that are not uh, prohibited, and that's been driven by prohibition. So, there's, I'll give you one example. When methadone was legal in the UK uh, for a couple of years uh, for MMC. Uh, that's the only year, 2009, 2010, is the only year that cocaine deaths dropped in the UK because so many people were using methadone instead of cocaine, and cocaine is substantially more toxic. So by careful regulation and encouraging people to use alternative drugs, you can drastically reduce death rates and reduce harm. You can't, you can't do that. You have no control at all if the criminals control the market. Once you've got drugs regulated, then you have controls, then you can approach it from a public health perspective and actually design the markets to reduce harm as much as possible. It's never going to be a perfect system because drugs are dangerous. We know drugs are dangerous, but we should be making them as safe as we possibly can, which yeah, we can do if we control them. I know Portugal has applied a similar rule. Uh, well, Portugal, they don't have any control over it. They've decriminalized, which is one step, but in my view, nowhere near enough. But I'm going to have to say, Thank you, because that's my time up. So thank you very much. Yeah.